ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار مرحبا بكم جميعا اهلا وسهلا we continue with the explanation of the six principles and we arrive to al asl as-sadis the six and last principle that has been mentioned by the noble imam sheikh al islam muhammad ibn abd wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala and this principle deals with refuting the doubt that has been placed by the shaitan regarding abandoning following the quran and following the sunnah and commanding with following of the different views and desires adhering to specific shuyukh or specific groups turning away from the book of Allah and the sunnah the author rahimahullah ta'ala he states radd ash-shubhat allati wada'aha ash-shaytan fi turk al-quran wa sunnah wa ittiba' al-ara wa al-ahwa al-mutafarriqa al-mukhtalifa وهي ان القران والسنه لا يعرفهما الا المجتهد المطلق والمجتهد هو الموصوف بكذا وكذا او صاف لعلها لا توجد تامه في ابي بكر وعمر فان لم يكن الانسان كذلك فليعرض عنهما فرضا حتما لا شك ولا اشكال فيه ومن طلب الهدى منهما فهو اما زنديق واما مجنون لاجل صعوبه فهمهما فسبحان الله وبحمده كم بين الله سبحانه شرعا وقدرا وخلقا وامرا في رد هذه الشبهه الملعونه من وجوه شتى بلغت الى حد الضروريات العامه ولكن اكثر الناس لا يعلمون قال الله تعالى لقد حق القول على اكثرهم فهم لا يؤمنون ان جعلنا في اعناقهم اغلالا فهي الى الاذقان فهم مقمحون وجعلنا من بين ايديهم سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فاغشيناهم فهم لا يبصرون وسواء عليهم انذرتهم ام لم تنذرهم لا يؤمنون انما تنذر من اتبع الذكر وخشى الرحمن بالغيب 
فبشره بمغفرة وأجر كريم آخره والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين The author he mentions, may Allah have mercy upon him, refuting the doubt which the shaitan has placed regarding abandoning the Quran and Sunnah and following the different separated views in matters of desires. And this shubuha that the shaitan has put in place is that no one understands the Quran and the Sunnah except for one who is an unrestricted mushtahid. And this will be explained. The mushtahid whose characteristics are such and such and such and such. Characteristics and descriptions that perhaps you will not completely find them in Abu Bakr or Umar. And if a person, he does not have these characteristics, then it is upon that person to turn away from the, from the Quran and the Sunnah as an obligation. He has to turn away from it. This is the Shubaha, the Shaitan he put. That if a person is not a complete, unrestricted, mujtahid, then it is obligatory upon him to turn away from the Quran and the Sunnah. That there is no doubt, and we're going to explain inshallah, and there is no doubt concerning this matter. And they view that whoever seeks guidance from the Quran and the Sunnah, then he is either a heretic or he is a person who has lost his mind. Why? Because of the extreme or the difficulty in understanding them. The Shaykh, he says, glory be to Allah and how far he is removed from any imperfection in the praises for him. How many times Allah Azza wa Jal or Allah subhanahu who has clarified by way of legislation and decree, by way of creation and command, refuting this cursed doubt from many different angles, which has reached the level of uh, uh, general necessity. However, most of the people, they do not know. Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentions, and indeed the statement of Allah has become the decree on most of them, so they do not believe. And we have placed on their necks shackles, and it is up to their the top of their throats, which make them people who have their heads raised. And we have placed in front of them a barrier, and from behind them a barrier, and we have covered them up, and they do not see. So whether you warn them or you do not warn them, they will not believe. The only ones that you can warn who will take heed are the ones who follow the remembrance and they fear the most merciful regarding the unseen give this one the glad tidings of forgiveness and a noble reward and at the end all of the praise is due to Allah the Lord of the creations and may the salah of Allah be upon our master Muhammad and upon his family and companions as well as the complete and abundance of salams up until the day of judgment so the author, he's ending with this principle. And the principle entails that it is obligatory to follow the Quran and the Sunnah and return back to the Quran and the Sunnah. And those who call the people away from following the, the Quran and the Sunnah, then this is from the followers of the shaitan. Because it is the shaitan who is calling the people away from the Quran and the Sunnah. And from the methodologies of falsehood that is used by the shaitan to call the people away from following the Quran and the Sunnah and to following the desires and the different views is by saying that it is not possible for the people to correctly understand the Quran and the Sunnah unless the person is a mujtahid that is mutlaq. 
And what is meant by al-mujtahid, al-mutlaq, this is a person who is capable of doing ishtihad in every science and matter of the deen. Meaning he's grounded in every aspect of knowledge. And this is basically impossible, as the scholars they say. And they want this individual to be a person, meaning he has deep, intense knowledge of every science. Every single, his knowledge is deep and intense. Knows the ins and outs. The scholars, they say that, or as the Sheikh himself mentioned that, these individuals are mentioning descriptions and characteristics that perhaps you will not completely find them in Abu Bakr and Umar. And they are the best of the Muslims. And they are the most knowledgeable of the Muslims. But there are some things they didn't know. These individuals who are propagating the shubah of the shaitan, they say, no, in order for a person to understand Quran and Sunnah, he has to be a, a mujtahid as mutlaq. And they mention these conditions. And in reality, there are conditions for ishtihad. But it is not what is being mentioned by these individuals who are following this satanic doubt. Ishtihad in the deen or legislatively means badl jahd li idraki hukman shar'iyan exerting oneself exerting oneself to comprehend or reach a legislative ruling and there are conditions for an ijtihad number one that the person he knows the legislative evidences that is in need for one to make ijtihad with like the verses that deal with the rules and regulations and the ahadith that are connected to those rules and regulations in order for a person to make ishtihad. Number two, the person must know that which is connected to the authenticity of the narrations or its weakness. Knowing its chains, its men, and other than that. And this is in order that a person doesn't use a weak hadith as a proof. Also, it is a must that a person understands the evidences and the rules and regulations connected to these evidences, whether the evidence is something that is general, whether the evidence is something that is specific, whether the evidence is uh, something that is unrestricted or restricted and other than that. The next condition that a person must have knowledge of the Arabic language. And he should have knowledge of the, fun the fundamentals of fiqh. The next condition that the person must have the ability to extract rulings from the evidences. He knows how to do it. These are six conditions and they were mentioned by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh al-Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala. When you look at these conditions, 
These conditions, F1, I skip one. The person must know the abrogated from the abrogating text. And he must know those matters in which the scholars have made ijma upon. So I repeat from the beginning. Number one, the person must know the legislated evidences that the individual is in need of to make ijtihad. Like the rule, like the verses of the rules and regulations and the ahadith of those rules and regulations. Number two, the person must know that which is connected to the authenticity of the hadith or the weakness of the hadith. Like knowing the chain of narrators and the men and the narrations and other than that, that which is connected to the hadith. So that he doesn't make a judgment based upon a weak hadith. Number three, the person he must know the abrogated text and those texts that abrogate. And he must know those matters in which the scholars have made ijma upon. In order that he does not judge with the text or make a ruling based upon the text that's abrogated or oppose the ijma of the scholars. Number four, the person must know from the evidences that which the ruling may differ in relation to something being specific or general, something being restricted or unrestricted. The person must know these things. In order that he doesn't pass a judgment in opposition to that. That's number four. Number five, a person must know the language. And he should know the foundations of fiqh. That which is connected to the evidence and the wordings of the evidences. Number six, that the person must have the ability to extract the rulings from the evidences. These conditions again were mentioned by the noble Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh al Uthaymeen. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Naam. Number two, that he must know that which is connected to the authenticity of the hadith or his weakness. These conditions mentioned by the Shaykh are matters that are attainable. And the scholars, past and present, they have met these conditions. But as for that which the people come with from the doubt of the Shaytan, then these matters are unattainable meaning that the person has to be precise in every single science. And he has to have memorized all of the texts. A person may be a scholar, but he hasn't memorized the, in the entire Quran. Not all of the Sahaba memorize the Quran. And not every scholar has memorized the entire Quran. But what's important is that he is knowledgeable and he knows the proofs and evidences of the mas'ala that he's making ijtihad in. Because there may be a matter that the scholar He's, he can make ishtihad and then it may be another matter. He, he, he doesn't have the ability to make ishtihad. Those who have the satanic doubt, they say, no, the person has to be all across the board a mujtahid. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions, وَالَّذِي عَلَيْهِ جَمَاهِرُ الْأُمَّةِ أن الاجتهاد جائز في الجملة والتقليد جائز في الجملة 
لا يجيبون الاجتهاد على كل أحد ويحرمون التقليد ولا يجيبون التقليد على كل أحد ويحرمون الاجتهاد وأن الاجتهاد جائز للقادر على الاجتهاد والتقليد جائز للعاجز عن الاجتهاد فأما القادر على الاجتهاد فهل يجوز له التقليد هذا فيه خلاف والصحيح أنه يجوز حيث عجز عن الاجتهاد شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية he says that which the majority of the ummah is upon is that ijtihad is permissible in one sense and blind following is permissible in another sense or in general they do not make ijtihad obligatory upon every person nor do they prohibit taqlid and they do not make taqlid obligatory upon every person, nor do they prohibit ijtihad. So here is one of the great scholars of this deen, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, establishing what we find the masses of the scholars upon. Different from what you find some of the ignorant saying in these days and times calling for individuals who do not have the ability to make ijtihad to make ijtihad and declaring taqlid to be prohibited in an unrestricted manner speaking to the common folk telling them you can't blind follow blind following is haram yes blind following is haram but there are some people who have to blind follow because they don't have the ability to make ijtihad. And there's some people who are not allowed to blind follow because they have the ability to make ijtihad. So the Shaykh he goes on to mention they do not mandate ijtihad upon every person, nor do they prohibit taqlid. And they do not mandate taqlid upon every person and prohibit ijtihad. Ijtihad is permissible for the one who has the ability to make ijtihad. And blind following is permissible for the one who does not have the ability to make ijtihad. As for the one who has the ability to make ijtihad, is it permissible for him to blind follow? Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah says, there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars regarding this. He says, and that which is correct, that it is permissible for him to blind follow when he is not able to make ijtihad. Even though he's a mujtahid in some matters, there may be something he does not have the ability to make ijtihad in. Salam. And this can be due to, there are many evidences that are, and he cannot come to a conclusion. It can be due to the time is restricted upon me. He doesn't have the time to go and research and the, the matter has to be dealt with right then and there. Or it may not be clear to him the evidence regarding the matter. So the shaykh he says, Rahimahullah, فَإِنَّهُ حَيْثُ عَجَزَ سَقَطَ عَنْهُ وُجُوبْ مَا عَجَزَ عَنْ so when he does not have the ability, meaning in this case to perform the ijtihad, then the obligation of performing the ijtihad is removed due to the lack of ability. He goes to that which is in place of it, and it is taqlid. Like for instance, كَمَا لَوْ عَجَزَ أَنْ التَّهَارَ بِالْمَا like if a person does not have the ability to make purification with water, what does he do? He makes tayammu. But if the, if the water is there, and he has the ability to make purification with the water, he has to make the purification with the water. Right? But now, he doesn't have the ability. And it's possible the water is there, but he doesn't have the ability to use it. Sometimes a person, he's a scholar, he... 
he knows he has the conditions and he he's and he's a person who's allowed to make ijtihad but as he's studying the mas'ala it hasn't become clear to him what the truth of the matter is so he follows another scholar that he deems to be more knowledgeable than him and he says the statement of Imam Ahmed is such and such the statement of Sheikh bin Baz is such and such this is this is not something that is blameworthy because nobody has all of the knowledge and that shows you why that shubaha is from the shaitan that a person has to be an unrestricted mujtahid in order to understand the Quran and the Sunnah so the Shaykh he goes on to mention Rahimahullah وَكَذَلِكَ الْعَامِ إِذَا أَمْكَنَهُ الْإِجْتِهَارِ فِي بَعْدَ الْمَسَائِلِ جَازَ لَهُ الْإِجْتِهَارِ Likewise a common person and, and please do not take this out of context If he is able to make ijtihad in some matters it is allowed for him to make ijtihad Meaning there may be a matter of salat. And he's read books on the salat. And he's looked at the statements of some scholars and looked at the statement of other scholars. And it became to him that one group of scholars, their position is stronger based upon those evidence. So he follows that. But yet he's not a scholar, he's a common folk. That which the person has the ability to do. It's allowed. But one should not misunderstand the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala that the common folk now are just to go beyond their level. Because the key word here is, the key word here is either amkanahu al-ijtihad if it is possible for him to make ijtihad. Because the matter of ijtihad, it can be broken into different parts. Meaning a person doesn't have to be a mushtahid in every single aspect of the deen in order to make ijtihad in one matter. The shaykh, says, وَقَدْ يَكُونَ الرَّجُلْ قَادِرًا فِي بَعْدٍ عَاجِزًا فِي بعد. It's possible that a man, he is capable in some matters and incapable in other matters. Tafadl. Walakin al qudra al al ijtihad la takun illa bi husul ulum to feed ma'rifatul matlub. However, the ijtihad does not take place except by way of the attainment of the knowledge that benefits having knowledge or understanding of that which is sought after. We find from those who are upon this methodology of the shaitan and turning the people away from the Quran and the Sunnah, the Hizbiyun. The Hizbis, they have people to pledge their allegiance to the Amir of the Hizb. To give bay'ah to the leader of the group, of the party. And this bay'ah is a bay'ah of hearing and obeying, unrestrictedly. Like Hassan al-Banna, in one of his principles... Is that there is to be blind obedience to the Amir of the group. And you cannot oppose him. Even if he calls you against the Quran and the Sunnah, you gotta follow the leader. Also, from those who make it mandatory upon the people to follow a specific madhab, 
And once you follow that madhab, you cannot go outside of that madhab. This is from the shubaha of the shayateen. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet has not made it mandatory upon the people to follow a specific person in all of his views. The only thing that we are obligated to follow unrestrictedly is the book of Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and that which the believers have agreed upon, meaning the sahaba, starting with them. Those things we cannot argue with, we cannot oppose. As for a scholar from the scholars, he can be right, he can be wrong. So we don't follow anyone as an individual and in everything he says except for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Kullu yukhad minhu aw yurad. Everyone can be taken from or rejected. Illa sahib had al qabr. Except for the one who was in that grave, meaning the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for other than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the matters of the deen, it's possible the person may give a fatwa that's correct. He may give a fatwa that's wrong. And the proof is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِذَا اجْتَهَدَ الْحَاكِمْ فَأَصَابَ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا وَإِذَا أَخْتَعَ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا That when a judge strives to make a ruling, if he's correct, he gets two rewards. If he's incorrect, he gets one reward. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is showing that it's possible that a judge, a person of knowledge, a scholar, can be wrong even though he's striving to reach the truth. If he's correct, he gets two rewards, the reward for striving and the reward for arriving to that which is correct. If he is incorrect, he gets a reward for his striving and Allah forgives him for his mistake because it wasn't intentional. So the Hizbis and those who are the fanatics of the Madahib they make it binding upon the people to follow the leader of the group or the madhab. And you cannot disobey under no circumstances. And to leave off that, they consider you to be a deviant. Even if you have an ayah from the Quran that you're following, an authentic hadith that you are following, you have left guidance in their eyes because you're not following the Amir you're not following the Sheikh of the Madhab likewise the Sufiya the extremists from amongst them or the Sufiya and their tariqas they say that the Murid and the Murid is like the beginning Sufi that he has to be with the Sufi Sheikh like how a dead body is with the person who is washing him how was a dead body with the person who is washing him. He's dead. Right. He, he turns whichever way the washer turns him. Turns him to the right. He turns to the right. Turns him to the left. He turns him to the left. Or they say he's like the dead person. Who has no view. No point of view. Or like the feather in the wind. Wherever the wind blows. That's where the feather goes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to follow his book. And that's what it means to be obedient to Allah. And he has commanded us to follow the sunnah of his messenger and that's what it means to be obedient to the messenger. And we are commanded to obey those in authority from amongst us, meaning from the Muslim rulers and the scholars. But the obedience to them is not unrestricted. As Allah Azawajal says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu ati'u allaha wa ati'u rasul wa ul al amri minkum. O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you. If you notice, Allah did not say, and obey those in authority from amongst you. He said, and those in authority from amongst you. Why? Because obedience to those in authority from amongst us is not unrestricted. And you'll find that in the statement of Allah, فَإِن تَنَزَّعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ This comes right after. فَرُضُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ 
And if you differ in anything, then refer it back to Allah and the Messenger. Allah didn't say and refer it back to those in, the, in authority. Because obedience to them is not unrestricted. But obedience to Allah is unrestricted. Obedience to the Prophet wasallam is unrestricted. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, إِنَّ فِي الْقَوْلِ بِوُجُوبِ طَاعَةِ غَيْرِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي كُلِّ أَمْرِهِ وَنَهِهِ هُوَ خِلَافُ الْإِجْمَاعِ So here we have the statement from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Indeed the statement that it is obligatory to obey other than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and everything that he commands with or prohibits this is in opposition to the consensus of the scholars. وَجَوَازُهُ فِيهِ مَا فِيهِ And is it being permissible in it is that which is in it. So the deviants, their understanding of al mushtahid al mutlaq is something that's unattainable. Because they have all of these conditions. And as the Shaykh himself said, you might not even find them with Abu Bakr and Umar. But as for the scholars of Usul, they have mentioned the mujtahid as mutlaq, but they mentioned the conditions that were mentioned. And these are conditions that are attainable and present with the scholars. Another aspect they come from, they say that, well, in relation to the hadith, the hadith that are weak and the hadith that are authentic. So we can't trust it. Because maybe you're, you're reading a weak hadith. The scholars have responded to them by saying, yes, there are hadith that are weak and there are hadith that are authentic. But has not there come the clarity to distinguish between the two? Of course. So take that which is authentic and leave that which is weak and unauthentic. There's some matters that we must adhere to in relation to the sunnah. Because when it comes to the Quran, there's no doubt. Everything is established in the Quran. There's no such thing as a weak ayah of the Quran. So there's no argumentation there. But they say, but still you don't know the interpretation. Unless you are the mushtahid mutlaq. According to their understanding of the mushtahid al-mutlaq. And then they say for the sunnah again, the weak hadith, authentic hadith. As for the sunnah, that which is established upon the Prophet wasallam, we must believe that it is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet wasallam said, Allah inni utitul Quran wa mithlahuma. Indeed, I have been given the Quran and it's like along with it. 
Secondly, we must believe that the sunnah has been protected by Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ did not make any mistakes when conveying the religion. Allah Azzawajal mentions, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرُ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ Indeed, we revealed the revelation. This includes the sunnahs, not just the Quran. And we will preserve it. And Allah says, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُحَىٰ And he, meaning the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He doesn't speak from his desires It's only revelation that's revealed to him The sunnah is protected The next matter We do not say That anything is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Unless we are sure That the matter is authentically established upon him So we hear a hadith We need to know the authenticity of the hadith Before we say that this is from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Once it is established that this is something that is authentically reported on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we submit with full submission, even if we don't fully comprehend. We say, that's the sunnah. As an example, the hadith of the fly. That if a fly falls into a drink, push it in, and then take it out. For indeed on one wing there is the sickness or the disease. And on the other wing there is the cure. A person hears this. He may not comprehend. And say how could this be? And especially prior to the age of the technology. But even if the person doesn't understand it's upon him to submit. That's what the Prophet said. Sallallahu alayhi wa He doesn't speak from his desires. It's only revelation revealed to him. Alhamdulillah. Scientists have done the study. From the Muslims. Placed liquid there. Put the fly in it. But did not do what the Prophet said. And the bacteria spread. And then the liquid in which the practice of the prophet was implemented in pushing the fly into it, there was no bacteria. And not that we need that to make us believers, because we believe whether that test was done or not. But to show that this is from the signs of prophethood. And whatever the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, even if it may not be clear right now, it will become clear. Another matter in relation to the sunnah, one must strive to understand the sunnah. For the ahadith, they have interpretations and explanations, just as there's interpretation for the Quran, an explanation for the ayat of the Quran. And rules and regulations that are extracted from the Quran. Likewise the sunnah. So this is the behavior that we have. In relation to. The sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The author rahimahullah ta'ala he ended. By stating that how many occasions have Allah subhanahu who clarified this matter by way of legislation, by way of decree, by way of creation, by way of command, refuting this cursed doubt from many different angles, but most people they do not know. And then he mentions the statement of Allah that the statement has become the truth or the decree upon most of them for they do not believe meaning that they will be astray Allah has decreed that most people will be astray and indeed we have made on their necks shackles that are up to their throats and it causes their heads to be lifted up this is the similitude that Allah gives in relation to the people who are astray, 
that they cannot lower their heads, meaning they cannot humble themselves to the revelation. So their heads are like this, raised up. And it is something that is preventing them from lowering it, which is the decree of Allah, which they are entitled to. And Allah has decreed their deviance due to the deviance that is within them. As Allah Azza wa Jal, He doesn't oppress anyone. So due to the severity of the shackle on their necks, it keeps their heads upright. And then Allah, he, he mentions that he has put in front of them and, from, and behind them barriers, meaning preventing them from iman. Sending them deeper into their arrogance and their obstinance. As Allah mentions, فَلَمَّا زَاقُوا أَزَاقَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ So when they deviated, Allah deviated their hearts. So these, are, these people, they're the ones who initiated the deviance. Allah wants everyone to be upon guidance. Meaning from the universal decree. Excuse me. From the legislative decree, Allah wants everyone to be upon guidance. But the universal decree, not everyone is going to accept the guidance. But legislatively, Allah wants all people to be guided. But the people, they turn away. Or as Allah mentions, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا in their hearts, there is a sickness. So Allah increased them in the sickness. So Allah has originally mentioned that we have covered them, they do not see. Meaning, Allah has covered them with ignorance and wretchedness. Meaning, that which is with them. This has become the obstacles in their way, that which blinds them from seeing the truth. And they are covered from every angle. From the front, from the back. So the warning does not benefit them. So Allah says, so whether you warn them or you do not warn them, they will not believe. It's going to be the same for them. Because Allah Azawajal has placed a seal upon their hearts to where they see the truth as being falsehood and the falsehood as being the truth. This is Surah Yasin. But those who will accept the truth, these are the ones, or those who do follow the truth, I should say, and follow the remembrance or the reminder, these are the ones who can be warned. These are the ones who take heed. These are the ones who are benefited by the advice that is given. Those who fear our Rahman in relation to the matters of the unseen, meaning they have the characteristic of number one, following the reminder meaning intentionally following the truth and they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so those who have these two characteristics Allah says give this person the glad tidings of forgiveness meaning for their sins and a generous noble reward meaning for their righteous actions and their uh, pure intentions and then the author rahimahullah ta'ala he ended with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah azza wa jal is praised in the beginning of the affairs as well as in the ending of the affairs and beseeching Allah to send the salah and the salam upon our beloved and noble prophet who is the master of the children of Adam on the day of judgment and upon his family and followers and companions up until the day of judgment and this is the end of the explanation of the six fundamental principles the verses from Surah Yasin, verses number 7 to 11. And whatever is correct, the praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever is incorrect, it is for myself. Wa subhanaka allam bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha anta astaghfirullah. Wa subhanahu wa Alhamdulillah, we finished another treaties. Inshallah ta'ala, next week, we will be starting with the nullifiers of Islam. Nawaqad al-Islam, bi-idhni ta'ala. And the praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair.